as most of you must be knowing the thyroid gland itself will con consists of thyroid follicles and uh, the follicles will be surrounded by the parafollicular cells and which will be interspersed in between the th thyroid follicles and also the follicle itself will be filled with colloid and the interstitial space will be filled with connective tissue and capillaries as is common in any other uh, tissue of the body. So uh, based on the cell of origin, we can differentiate whether it is a follicular epithelial cell derived cancer or a parafollicular C cell derived cancer. So as you all know, parafollicular derived cell uh, will be medullary carcinoma of thyroid and from the follicular cells will come the differentiated thyroid cancer which consists of papillary, follicular and others like Hertel cell and Toll cell variants and also the undifferentiated type of cancer which is generally called as anaplastic cancer. So today we will be dealing with the everything else except for the papillary carcinoma of the thyroid. So papillary thyroid carcinoma generally is around 80% of the all thyroid cancers. Thankfully, the non-papillary are only 20% and I say thankfully because they behave very differently, their management is different, they are more aggressive, they have very poor prognosis and most of the morbidity that is associated with thyroid cancer is generally due to the non-papillary variants. So how do we differentiate them from the papillary variant or from the benign is by history, uh, uh, which includes the gender, the duration of symptoms and the symptoms as such, which I will be dealing with in the subsequent slides. The examination findings, which will show the consistency whether the surrounding structures are infiltrated or not. And then also the imaging uh, modalities which can be used to differentiate between various types of cancers. And of course, FNAC and biopsy will give a definitive answer whether it is uh, papillary or not. And uh, of course, serum markers are always there which are going to differentiate certain varieties of cancer. So first I would like to start with uh, the follicular carcinoma of the thyroid. The reason I'm starting with this is that it is the second most common after the papillary carcinoma and treatment lines are more or less similar to the papillary carcinoma of thyroid. The difference being uh, in the, his, the way it behaves, it spreads more commonly by the vascular channels as compared to the lymph node metastasis. So, like in papillary carcinoma of thyroid, as the stage progresses, you generally deal with lymph node metastasis before the distant metastasis comes. But in follicular carcinoma, you would be expecting to see more of distant metastasis compared to cervical lymph nodes. So, sometimes you might not actually have any cervical lymph nodes, but the patient may present with a fractured femur pathological fracture or with lung meds. And uh, the issue is that FNAC cannot differentiate between follicular and adenoma and carcinoma. That is, it cannot differentiate whether it's a benign follicular lesion or it's a malignant follicular lesion uh, because the only way to differentiate the two is by uh, knowing the capsular and vascular infiltration which can be made out only by histopathology, not by FNAC because the FNAC will not be able to take cells from the capsule or the, or the surrounding vessel, which can be seen only in the gross histopathological specimen. Then the treatment of choice as for papillary carcinoma is again the same as that is surgery, which is total thyroidectomy followed by radioactive iodine therapy wherever the metastatic lesions may be. Sometimes if there is a follicular variant of papillary carcinoma of thyroid, which is generally uh, clubbed with either this uh, papillary or with follicular. 
in that you may have a neck nodal metastasis for which neck dissection is essential wherever the nodes are palpable so basically in any thyroid carcinoma differentiated thyroid carcinoma that is ptc and ftc you will try to remove all the removable uh, thyroid tissue anywhere in the body so generally it is there in the neck and we deal with the radioactive iodine for the uh, metastatic lesions so for the prognosis we know that it is a well differentiated uh, carcinoma and it has a good prognosis to the extent that uh, 5 10 and 20 year survival is also seen and 85 80 and 76% respectively are the overall survival rates and uh, patients generally do very well they generally don't have any deviation from their routine life but high risk population is the one with poorly differentiated variants and sometimes they have widely invasive carcinoma that is the surrounding structures are invaded so you tend to not get a r0 resection and for that reason you will keep getting uh, minimal residual tissue in the neck always whenever you are doing radioactive iodine also and uh, <clears throat> patients who have distant metastasis at diagnosis like some patients always get diagnosed uh, because they get a pathological fracture in a long standing thyroid nodule they generally tend to uh, not uh, go for surgery in a initial stage so intermediate risk is basically because of older age and uh, larger tumor but without much of a invasive component in the neck and patients with lymph node metastasis will also be intermediate risk and generally if there is a young patient with intrathyroidal uh, malignancy then they are uh, considered as low risk factor for follicular carcinoma of thyroid so now we'll come to arguably the one of the worst cancers in the body because uh, anaplastic carcinoma of thyroid has a mortality rate of over 90% and uh, they generally survive a maximum of 6 months uh, to 1 year after the diagnosis. So it is so bad that you generally don't have stage 1, 2, 3 in anaplastic carcinoma of thyroid. You generally only have stage 4. Only stage 4A is that it is a... Uh, tumor which does not extend beyond the thyroid and T4B when the surrounding structures are involved and um, when there is a metastatic lesion then it is 4C and we generally uh, deal that only with palliative chemotherapy. So the importance of knowing when to suspect uh, anaplastic carcinoma of thyroid is very important because not all uh, not all clinicians will actually try to differentiate a thyroid nodule sometimes they don't even go for fnac i have seen a lot of uh, surgeons myself who don't go for initial fnac and they say it's a it looks like a, a small nodule let's just not let's just excise it and after going in they will just burn their hands by because it's got infiltrated everywhere and sometimes it is such a large necrotic uh, hemorrhagic uh, mass and uh, it will be infiltrating the surrounding neck structures and that is that becomes inoperable so they generally go in see it is inoperable and then come out and uh, it becomes very difficult for uh, the surgeon to explain to the patients what is happening so the mean age of presentation is generally in the 60s so what generally happens is it's a long standing thyroid nodule which de differentiates and the usually what was well differentiated becomes de differentiated and worsens in its uh, uh, overall course and uh, it grows so rapidly that uh, the patients may not be able to actually reach the hospital that's why it is only 2% of the patients are having 
of met, uh, anaplastic carcinoma, most of the patients may be unnoticed or unaccounted for. So there are three histological growth patterns which are mainly seen. One is a spindle cell, one is a pleomorphic giant cell, and one is a squamoid uh, type of uh, histology. That is the reason why uh, chemotherapy generally acts on anaplastic carcinoma of thyroid, but it does not act on any other well-differentiated thyroid malignancies. So most common presentation is 4C. So that's how bad it is. And uh, we generally don't see patients of 4A. 4B sometimes when the patient is coming early for hoarseness of voice. So they generally present with uh, a big mass, with hoarseness of voice, sometimes uh, difficulty breathing, which is uh, there only for the last two, three months or two, three weeks also sometimes. And it generally is uh, uh, very aggressive. And by that, it is so aggressive that sometimes you have seen the patient in the OPD and by the time they come back to you saying that we want surgery, it has grown in stage. So uh, it may be inoperable at that time. So the surgery, as I have uh, mentioned, it will be very variable. You have to try to remove all the thyroid tissue, but uh, it may or may not be uh, curative in them. So you have to deal with that uh, with the counseling part at the earlier stage based on your uh, clinical and uh, FNAC findings and also your uh, imaging findings. So uh, do a total thyroidectomy, neck dissection, central compartment clearance, tracheal resections, laryngectomy whenever it is required. But still, you will have to give an external beam radiation with or without cisplatin-based chemotherapy. Uh, so uh, even with such a morbid procedure, you can see the overall survival time. Without surgery, it is less than one year in most of the cases. Maximum person that has uh, uh, survived would be for a year. Uh, and if you are able to do a R0 or R1 resection and give an external beam radiotherapy in a non-metastatic setting, there is a chance that the patient may survive for three to four years, but you don't expect it to happen in all cases. So that is why most of the research over thyroid cancer is based on anaplastic carcinoma only because we are able to see how many, uh, we have seen that how many mutations are being seen in every anaplastic carcinoma of thyroid and Based on the mutations that have been seen, we have actually evolved in giving so many uh, type of drugs which are either immunotherapy or uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors or anything which has tried to uh, improve survival. But as of now, uh, we have not been able to give a, uh, something which is going to prolong life for a longer time.